So I, I work at NCBI, and we've, we've gone through some changes recently. So uh, we've had a reorganization. Oh, can you not hear me? Oh, that's better. OK. Let's put it close to my lips. So as a, a part of uh, what we do as a part of PubChem, where we're dealing with chemical information content, we've been moved from the research side, and we're now on the production side. Uh, the difference for us is that the, some of the ways in which we approach information we have to think a little bit differently about as opposed to simply researchers. We think more in terms of how we can provide a product for our users. And one of the primary things that we do is try to provide the information content and knowledge which is available through chemistry. So those of you who, who don't know what PubChem is, or if you have forgotten, what we're attempting to do is to find all of the known chemical information content that uh, relates to the, their biological activity or role. So almost everything that you know or do can relate to that. Uh, every time you, you touch something and you put it on your skin, uh, its physical properties, its, its uh, uh, biological activity and how it interacts with you or for other things uh, in the environment or otherwise, we want to capture all that content. So we're an open archive and we contain tens of millions, hundreds of millions of things that are then cross-linked to each other, which gives you billions and trillions, quadrillions of things. And so how you provide that linked data content back out to you is always a, a very difficult and, and challenging problem. Let's give you some idea. Uh, you can't probably see this from the back, but when you deal with how this data links together and how you can then provide it back out to researchers like yourselves is not easy because we have tens of millions of one type of object interacting with hundreds of millions of other types of objects you know, what is really useful for you to have or to keep is always a, a difficult problem. We have PubChem RDF as a way to express data links, but it's only a subset of the information content that is available. But the key thing that we've done with the RDF versus just PubChem data links is that we're using semantic ontologies as a way for you to interact with that content. But because we have a lot of content, trying to keep it at a manageable level has been very challenging for us. Back in uh, 2013, when we tried to create the first version of PopChem RDF, we just did a, a sample of, of 100,000 compounds and just as a, to see how it would, would scale. We computed that we'd have tens if not hundreds of trillions of triples in our store if we just did how we thought of the data. Uh, at that point in time. And so by rethinking it, we've been able to get to a manageable number, and a net manageable number that we think you all would be interested in having is about 100 billion triples. It's our limiting factor as to how many triples we can provide to you is the size, which is about 250 gigabytes of compressed information content. Every time we add something, we need to pull something away. And so trying to find how we can approach this is, is, uh, is always the challenge. We don't provide you a Sparkle query endpoint for you to use either. The idea is that you would download this content and use your own Sparkle query endpoint. We do give you a RESTful interface, which is a Sparkle-like interface, but really limits the types of queries that you can perform on the data. So that way, we only give you fast queries back if you're trying to ask a more difficult problem, you probably should download the content yourself. Give you some idea of uh, usage. Uh, we, we get thousands of requests a day. We get uh, tens of users, if not hundreds of users, uh, accessing the content. The difficulty for us is that when you put RDF into context of other programmatic access approaches to PubChem, RDF, which is still there in yellow, you don't even see. Um, we went from thousands of requests, uh, tens, hundreds of thousands of requests, and now we've gone to millions of requests. In terms of users, you see tens, hundreds of users. But when you go and you start to consider uh, RESTful-based approaches we have uh, for general uh, 
uh, PubChem programmatic interfaces, we're in tens of thousands of users per day. RDF users are orders of magnitude fewer than other programmatic interfaces to PubChem. And for us, it's a little bit of a challenge because how do you justify one approach versus the other? But when you look at it from a growth perspective, while we are seeing year-over-year um, uh, -year growth uh, comparing this year versus last year, about 20% for PubRest, we see more requests with PubChem RDF. But the user base isn't really growing. And we're, we're interested in trying to reach more people and getting your ideas and how we could do that would be helpful to us. Maybe other things to note is that our uh, SOAP-based protocols for programmatic interface have been going down. So you can see that as a technology that's going away in a sense, which we would expect. Uh, whereas REST continues to grow, very strong growth in terms of uh, new users uh, interacting with that. We have a number of, of plans for RDF, although we've been on a development pause. We, we pause because we don't have any space to put any more triples that we think that you would want to access. Because we could continue to give you many, many additional hundreds of billions of links between things. So we're working towards reducing the number of chemical similarity links we have between entities because that makes up about, oh, I don't know, several tens of billions of entities that we have. And we're looking to provide uh, more links between publication trails of, of entities. We have a link between a chemical and a gene. Are there any publications that help to back that up? Or are there other near, near neighborhood information events that we could otherwise provide to you? Because it's semantically linked, you have pretty much all the, the uh, predicates li uh, listed out, all of the, the different semantic types. Um, which are available within PubChem RDF. We give you different use cases and how you can use the content. These yellow nodes that you see here kind of gives you a, you can't really see it because it's kind of smeared out for some reason with this projector. Gives you some sense of the different types of major aspects. But an important thing to, to say is that we integrate with other RDF collections, like those that are at EBI. But it gives you all the, the sort of the core content that's within PubChem, biological activities between entities, links to publications, but what you don't see things are patents. Just for uh, links between chemical substances and patent documents alone, we have over 400 millions of those types of links. If we then express anything that, about what that patent is, uh, title, everything else, you can imagine that we'd already be giving you, uh, you know, between one and, and 10 billion triples just based on patent information content. If we expose more of the information we know exists within publications, again, we could give you many other tens, if not hundreds of billions of additional triples that you may be interested in. So what I'm trying to say is, you know, as people who are working with RDF, if we want to express the content that exists, that is available to us, we need more efficient ways to distill down what is the useful information people want in a linked format. Because otherwise, no one's going to really use it, right? I mean, why would you want to get back, you know, 50 billion links between two genes, right? Or and everything else that it connects, and everything else it connects. It, it's just too much. Another problem we've been working on is, which is a really a vexing problem as an aggregator like PubChem is, is we have lots of information that's on one side which is geared towards human understanding. And then we have the other side of this divide, which is the computer understanding, which I would, I would say the RDF express content. And we have this gap in between where we have human intent, which is missing. So if you're trying to work with information content that exists within, say, a publication, you can use computer algorithms to pull out that content. But you may be missing a lot of that data that's implicit for human understanding within that. If you uh, have a depiction and you have some information in the text and other parts in a, a table, being able to stitch it back together, a human could recognize it by eye very quickly. But the computer 
it just has this disparate pieces of information. It doesn't know how to join it back together again. Problem for us inside PubChem is that this data gets all linked together, and we have a problem. The other thing is that because everybody's using computers to help, you know, on one side we, we have uh, the humans, and the other side we have the computers. And you know, in the middle is our algorithms. You know, how do we kind of pull all that together? All right, I'm going to speed up a lot. But one thing is that we need a killer app for RDF. In some sense, we already have it. It's Google, Siri, other types of entities. This is semantic and RDF-based linked data at work. But how do we do this for science? How do we make something that, that people really want to use that could take advantage of tens of hundreds of billions, if not uh, tens or hundreds of trillions of links between things? In PubChem, we've now expanded annotation to about 30 million compounds. And we've been increasing the breadth and depth of what you can have based on very different types of data types. So here's a glucose. We have structures, but we have a half a million compounds now with biologic type descriptions. We have tens of thousands of compounds that have, uh, say, uh, nearly 200,000 to 300,000, which have spectra type information content. We have literally uh, just hundreds of millions of links to publications, hundreds of millions of links to patents. We have you know, tens of different types of classifiers for chemicals. If you want to work in an abstracted way with information content, you have some way to dial in or dial out based on how you use these various other ontologies. And just expressing those links alone would generate billions of triples. But these information sources and how people are interacting with this content is really much geared towards human understanding at this point. And this is what's really driving the usage. So unless you can find ways to harness and utilize this content, you know, if we want to advance computer understanding of the, the available information content, we have to do something more with this. We've been trying to do this for users in part by taking the linked data content and providing these sort of data views where you can start to view information content based on, say, a, a gene. And we provide a, a rather PubChem-like uh, uh, display where you have lots of annotation and other types of information that gives context to what's there. But we have now are expanding this to uh, proteins, which we'll release this fall, where you can interact with the same content. But we would then expand this to diseases and try to find other ways that we can provide intersections between this. So we've been in introducing uh, entirely new families of, of uh, interfaces. And you know, one thing to note is that we're working more with what we call dyads, and we're working towards what we are calling triads, where you can start to look at intersections and ask rather difficult questions. So you can say, OK, I want to find all P450 inhibitors uh, and how they associate with iron receptors. Or I want to find all FDA-approved drugs involving estrogen receptors and Chagas disease. So being able to do those types of intersections, I think, would be very useful for users where they could take advantage and, and sort of have a more or less a killer app in how they extend things. But we're dealing with lots of many-to-many -many type relationships, which are very difficult to work with. We've been uh, doing crowd curation of chemical names in part by classifying the names that are there. We have uh, really hundreds of different authoritative sources of information content. And we're trying to find ways to uh, improve upon our understanding. In fact, uh, I'll be working on part of this is, is uh, some things I do here at the Biohackathon. We've been doing a lot more towards uh, chemical gene linking, uh, chemical disease type linking. Uh, we've been, part, uh, been using uh, uh, PubMed and, and uh, uh, name entity recognition software to sort of cross-validate the information content that's available uh, using PubTator and LeadMine and how it interacts with various other um, uh, the SORI and, and curated data sources. But one, one of the things we've been trying to do here is if you have tens of thousands of papers or publications about an entity, we can use these hierarchies as a way to uh, aggregate the information content and then summarize in some sort of way. So if you find, for instance, um, uh, 38,000 or so uh, publications having to do with an a, uh, anti-cancer drug, you can find, oh, they're involved with various types of, of uh, types of information, such as um, 
you know, what part of the body is it, uh, where, where did the disease come from. And you can start to summarize the content available using these types of um, uh, groupings and, and classifiers. I'm sort of flying through this a little bit fast, but what we've been able to find is that we can reproduce a lot of the major topics that are found uh, that are indicated by human curators uh, doing midline indexing using MeSH as to what their entities are that are of important. But we were also applying this to chemicals to find what other entities are, say, associated to a, a given chemical relative to the biomedical literature. We've uh, recently launched, uh, just uh, about a week ago, actually just a few days ago, uh, NCBI Glycan's website. Uh, some of this has come out of biohackathon based efforts where we have this uh, uh, symbolic nomenclature associated with uh, uh, Ajit Varki's uh, glycobiology book. Uh, but the idea here is a recognition that glycans and, and glycoscience is of importance, and we're trying to do more in terms of how we can better integrate that effort. But uh, we've also been involved in a number of other standards efforts, uh, both within IUPAC and others. In fact, we had a, a workshop, a three-day workshop at uh, NIH uh, in August, the 16th through the 18th. And we had a, another one previously at EBI this year in, in March. Uh, we're, we've also have a lot more to do. If you can imagine, you're dealing with such a wide, diverse space of, of information content. We are finding ways to make improvements. We're focusing a bit more on the users at this point, and we're trying to expand it back out into data linking as we sort of catch up. Uh, it would be neat to see if we could get more of your input as a type of linked data that you would like to see, because chances are we have it available. We can summarize it for you. But if we're not giving you the content that you really want, we're not really helping anybody with the efforts that we're doing. So I would say please come see me at the Biohackathon. Uh, we do need your input. Uh, I just want to thank the PubChem crew and special thanks to the various Biohackathons in the past, but also our other collaborators. And so uh, best wishes to you for a very productive Biohackathon, and I'm very happy for any questions. Thank you.